Over the course of the 18th century, there were multiple challenges aimed at traditional institutions. This century, called the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, is often seen as the transition between two historical eras. The period after the Middle Ages, which includes the Renaissance and the Scientific Revolution, is called the Early Modern Period, while the era after about 1800 is referred to as the Modern Era. In some ways, the Enlightenment belongs to both, and in others, to neither. Today, we're looking at the Enlightenment. The social world of the Enlightenment was a slightly different one from that of the Renaissance or even that of the Scientific Revolution. During the Renaissance, the majority of the benefits had belonged to the wealthy, whether that description meant the aristocracy or the upper levels of the merchant class. But during the Scientific Revolution, participating members had also been those of the wealthier classes and the clergy. During the Enlightenment, though, those restrictions did change at least a little. While some of the thinkers of the philosophes of the Enlightenment were members of the nobility, others were members of the middle class, even the lower middle class, who had managed to become educated, usually through church-run schools, and had then taken it upon themselves to continue their scholarly explorations. Sadly, though, the majority of the common people, and especially those at the bottom of the social scale, didn't necessarily realize this revolution in thought was occurring. If you didn't or couldn't read, you didn't necessarily realize the importance of the Enlightenment as it was happening. Well, that's because the Enlightenment was a literary revolution, meaning that the ideas which challenged the status quo were published. A benefit of the Enlightenment and a trend that had been occurring since the invention of the printing press was the growth of the publishing community and, concurrently, the growth of the readership community. And not only were more books published than before, but other literary genres like pamphlets and magazines and newspapers also exploded in numbers. In London, the first daily newspaper, the Daily Current, was printed in 1702. Well, the benefit of the newspaper was that it was relatively cheap, and it was even provided in some establishments for free. While early newspapers didn't include the pictures that modern-day newspapers do, they did provide updates on the most important news of the day. So even if you could read just a little, you could still figure out what was going on in the world. Oh, at the same time, the Enlightenment was a public revolution, meaning that people met to discuss the ideas that were published. The best meeting place for individuals discussing Enlightenment ideas was the Salon, the drawing rooms of the wealthy elite, which combined philosophers and aristocrats and wealthy middle-class people on its guest lists. Well, in addition to the salons, people also met at coffee houses. Unlike the public houses called pubs, which tended to have a lower class clientele, coffee houses were not places which combined a dining room, a bar, and an inn, but places that catered to a wealthier social clientele and where the purpose was to drink the newly popular beverage, coffee, and to meet people for conversation. Many coffee houses sold or gave newspapers away, and they had small libraries, further catering to that wealthier, more educated clientele. Well, the combination of all of this interaction meant that ideas were being exchanged more frequently than before. They were becoming well-known faster than had ever happened before. And inevitably, this is going to cause a shift in culture. While there are many elements to the Enlightenment, we're going to focus mainly on the political ideas of the Enlightenment, as that had the largest impact in the immediate aftermath of the era and, arguably, continues to have an impact to this day. If we focus on the political, it's important to realize that the earliest Enlightenment philosophers were often writing to challenge absolutism, the prevailing political ideology of the 16th and 17th centuries. In the 17th century, before the Enlightenment, there were some political philosophers who wrote in favor of absolutism. Thomas Hobbes, a supporter of the Royalists during the English Civil War, wrote Leviathan while exiled in France. This was the first excerpt you read as homework. Think about what Hobbes writes. How do we characterize human nature? Well, because of this characterization, what does he argue needs to happen in order to form a society? Over the course of this document, 
One of Hobbes's main points was that the system of absolutist monarchy was the best way in which to maintain a stable political system, and thus a stable society. Of course, since we know Hobbes supported the royalists during the English Civil War, it's clear that one of his motives in writing Leviathan is to reiterate that the royalists were the right side of the Civil War. By the end of the 17th century, we begin to see philosophers writing to challenge absolutism. Another Englishman, John Locke, wrote two treatises on government in the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Remember, the Glorious Revolution was an event in which Parliament asserted its political authority by forcing James II to abdicate in favor of his daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange. Locke is writing after England had experienced the dictatorial rule of a so-called republic led by Oliver Cromwell, and after Parliament has asserted its control over the new monarchs by forcing them to sign the English Bill of Rights. In other words, Locke publishes this piece after England has become a constitutional monarchy. In the excerpt you read, Locke is revisiting the concept of human nature, which Hobbes addressed in Leviathan. Now think about the differences between Locke and Hobbes with respect to how they think humanity existed in nature, i.e. before civilization. As you no doubt noted when reading, Hobbes has a rather negative view of human nature. Humans are violent and, because we're largely evenly skilled, our entire lives in the state of nature were spent fighting one another to keep what we'd managed to acquire. We constantly fought until someone stronger came along and guaranteed that we'd get to keep our stuff so long as we followed his rules. That was the basis of a stable society, a stable absolutist society. Locke, on the other hand, has a more positive view of human nature. Locke argues that all men, keep in mind the Enlightenment is still an era of strong patriarchy, all men have rights conferred to them by nature, but without a society in place, all of us are constantly fighting to maintain all of those rights. By agreeing to live together in a civil society, humans agree to give up some of their natural rights so as to protect and maintain others. And humans agree to set up a system, a government, whereby some people's jobs are to ensure the protection of those rights. For Locke, the social contract is the mutual obligations between the government and the people toward one another, and for the maintenance of those rights, now called civil rights, not natural rights, since they're protected by the government. Whereas Hobbes had argued that the subjects must give up their power to the sovereign so that he could maintain the peace, Locke believed that, since society was built on the fact that people voluntarily gave up their rights to the government, those people could always withdraw their support from the government if the government did something that the people didn't agree with. This concept, popular sovereignty, sovereignty of the people, this was the reason why the English Parliament was right to act against James II, with whom they didn't agree, and change the monarchy. Or so John Locke believed. As might be expected, philosophers on the continent didn't begin to challenge absolutism until the 18th century. Kingdoms and empires on the European continent didn't experience a civil war like England did. Once countries like France began to challenge absolutism, however, they couldn't help but draw some comparisons between England's constitutional monarchy and the absolutist monarchies of the continent. Charles de Secondat, the Baron de Montesquieu, used the scientific method, research and observation, to discover what he believed were natural laws for government. In his study, The Spirit of the Laws, which was published in 1748, he asserted that there were three basic forms of government, the republic, the despotism, and the monarchy. And he also discussed the various types of political power within that government. In the excerpt you read, what does Montesquieu argue about the types of political power within the government? As you no doubt understood, Montesquieu asserts that there exists, or should exist, a separation of powers within a government, which would then allow for checks and balances. In other words, governments should be divided into multiple branches and no one branch should be so powerful that it could not be checked by another branch. 
Well, Montesquieu's conclusion makes sense in context. He's writing in 1748, just 30 or so years after the death of Francis Louis XIV, the great sun king, the king who modeled absolutism to everyone else in Europe. Remember, Louis XIV had concentrated political and economic power in his own hands, and by the time of his death in 1715, France was in debt, and because of war, had tenuous relationships with other countries in Europe. Montesquieu likely saw France's position as the problem of one person having way too much power. Another French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, also commented on government in general and in France specifically. Borrowing somewhat from John Locke's ideas of natural law and civil society, Rousseau extended those arguments a bit when he wrote The Social Contract in the middle of the 18th century. You read an excerpt of this text. Well, like Locke, Rousseau believed in the concept of natural law and that humans sacrificed some of their natural rights when they agreed to live in a society. In this way, civil society preserved the most important of those natural rights. Rousseau emphasizes that, while living in a society, humans agreed to be ruled by what he called the general will, basically by the majority's will. Rousseau seems to be describing not a constitutional monarchy per se, but rather a democracy or a republic in the modern sense of the word. This is certainly a change from the France in which Rousseau lived, a France which was still an absolutist monarchy, although the monarch at the time, Louis XV, wasn't anywhere near as powerful as Louis XIV had been. How other Enlightenment figures didn't challenge absolutism so much as they challenged the general uneducated and intolerant mindset of the era. They were trying to effect cultural change. The writer Voltaire was an early adopter of Enlightenment ideals, perhaps because he was continually in trouble as a young man for criticizing various elements of the French government and the Catholic Church. His best known work, Candide, is a satire criticizing the philosophy of optimism. This work was published in 1759. The novella is organized as a great journey, not unlike the adventure tales of the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, in which the protagonist, Candide, and his guide and mentor, Pangloss, travel the world and come face to face with its hardships. In the story, Voltaire is quick to criticize all of those social, political, and religious elements of society which do not fit in with an Enlightenment worldview. Now, Voltaire was a prodigious writer, and he also penned pamphlets and articles for publication. For class, you read an excerpt from his article, A Plea for Tolerance. Now, Voltaire's writing is more direct than that of Rousseau, and his meaning is clear because he's so direct. As you read, Voltaire argues that all people, especially Christians, should practice tolerance and that tolerance is necessary to an enlightened society. Denis Diderot was one of the most celebrated of the philosophes, in large measure because of his great work, the Encyclopedia, which is the attempt of a devout philosoph to organize and categorize the sometimes radical ideas of the Enlightenment. Now, Diderot intended his encyclopedia to serve as education and enrichment to anyone who had the ability to access and read it. The encyclopedia included, as relatively short summaries, the varied concepts of over 150 philosophes, as well as articles on scientific knowledge. Now, because of its content, the publication of the 28-volume encyclopedia was shut down several times, and it required subterfuge on the part of Diderot, the primary editor, and his contributors to publish the final 26 volumes. Now, for class, you were asked to read several short excerpts of this text not so much for discussion in class, but so that you could see the ways in which the ideas of the Enlightenment were presented for a literate audience. Now consider the extent to which Locke's political ideas are reflected. Think also about how and why Diderot argues for the freedom of the press. Now when considering Diderot's motivation, it's important to think about why he and others considered the publication of the encyclopedia a vital step in the philosoph's hope for political, social, and cultural reform. While the push for reforms were largely centered on the political or social realms, Scottish economist Adam Smith 
challenged the economic philosophy of mercantilism, which had been developed in Louis XIV's absolutist France. At the time that Smith is writing, mercantilism is the economic policy that absolutist states, and remember, most European states are absolutist, had in place. In 1776, Smith published On the Wealth of Nations, a study which stipulated that economies work best when they're not at all regulated by governments. He called this laissez-faire economics. Smith felt that mercantilism encouraged a government's over-involvement in economics and that it actually hampered both economic growth and innovation. Later economists will refer to Smith's ideas as classical economics, and his book helps form the argument for capitalism. Well, while Smith was critical of the government's intense involvement in the economy, which in a mercantilist system involved mostly the subsidy of certain industries, he advocated government intervention in the case of basic regulation. Smith did not see the value of large corporations and monopolies as he saw those as a hamper to economic competition. By the end of the 18th century, some philosophers were challenging the longest held cultural and social beliefs of European society, the Christian religion and patriarchy. Now, some of these philosophes had begun espousing a new type of religion that was, in their opinion, in complete accordance with reason and nature. For them, this new religious belief, deism, was the rational religion of the enlightened individual. But Thomas Paine was one of the most outspoken of the deists. His is a name you've likely heard before. Paine was a well-known political activist. In 1776, he'd published a treatise called Common Sense, which supported the American Revolution. In the 1790s, Paine published an essay called The Age of Reason, which sets forth the argument for deism over other religious beliefs. This text unsurprisingly focuses on a critique of Christianity, since Christianity was a religion practiced by a majority of Europeans in the 18th century. You were asked to read an excerpt from this text for discussion in class. In the text, Paine makes it clear that he's no atheist. He declares, I believe in one God and no more. And he further asserts his argument with a major Enlightenment ideal when he claims that he believes in the equality of man. Near the end of the excerpt you read, Paine comes to a specific conclusion with regards to Christianity. He states, quote, It appears that Thomas did not believe the resurrection and, as they say, would not believe without having ocular and manual demonstration himself. So neither will I. Well, the Thomas to whom Paine refers isn't himself, but is rather the Apostle Thomas, one of Jesus' apostles. Well, Paine is referencing the New Testament's Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 24 to 29, in which Thomas doubts that a resurrected Jesus has appeared to the other apostles when they tell him that Jesus was there. Well, Thomas tells the others that he will not believe Jesus has been resurrected until he sees Jesus himself and has put his hands in the wounds on Jesus' hands and in Jesus' side. According to the Gospel, when Jesus next appears to the apostles, Thomas is present, and so Jesus speaks directly to Thomas, asking him to come forward and to satisfy his curiosity about Jesus' resurrection. The apostle Thomas required direct observation of Jesus' resurrection, proof, before he would believe. Thomas Paine indicates that, as an enlightened individual who values the use of reason over blind belief, he will also be doubtful about Jesus' resurrection until he can satisfy his own curiosity by touching a resurrected Jesus. Well, think about the impact this assertion would have had on a religious society. While deism was accepted in certain circles in the 18th century, it was certainly not accepted by society as a whole. While there weren't many organized challenges to patriarchy, Mary Wollstonecraft would publish a text which certainly became the basis for an argument on women's equality. While Mary was born into a well-to-do family whose income was squandered by her father, a man who apparently was violent and given to beating his wife. Once she reached her maturity, Mary, who had been well-educated, 
had to earn an income. So she became a lady's companion, then a teacher and a governess, pretty much the only lines of respectable work open to a woman in her particular social position. Oh, given that line of work, she became passionate about the subject of women's education, and she joined the circle of philosophers, including men like Thomas Paine and William Godwin, who were interested in similar subjects. But she wrote her most famous work, A Vindication on the Rights of Women, in 1792. In the excerpt you read for class, Mary is arguing that women are not by nature weaker or less able than men, but rather that women have been socialized to be weaker and less able. She argues that what society allows as women's education tends to make women the creatures of sensation. She says, quote, this overstretched sensibility naturally relaxes the other powers of the mind and prevents intellect from attaining that sovereignty which it ought to attain to render a rational creature useful to others. She further asserts that, quote, we would hear none of these infantile airs if girls were allowed to take sufficient exercise. Further, she argues that women, quote, would be more respectable members of society and discharge the important duties of life by the light of their own reason if they were simply educated, similarly to men. As you can imagine, Wollstonecraft's arguments were quite radical for the time and not at all accepted by the majority of society, even by many of her own educated peers. Not that their criticism stopped her. A Wollstonecraft was a career woman before the term was coined. She was fascinated with the idea of revolution. She traveled to France in 1792, shortly after publishing her book, just to see the outcome of the revolution in France, which had begun in 1789. While there, she fell in love with an American, Gilbert Imlay, who was also visiting. And while she would give birth to their daughter Fanny in 1794, she and Gilbert never married. She wrote an account of the French Revolution which was based on her own lived experience as well as her review of journals, letters, and documents from others who'd lived through it as well. This history was published in 1794. In March of 1797, Mary wed her old friend, philosopher William Godwin, with whom she'd fallen in love. They'd live in what both called a true partnership. They kept separate but neighboring households. It was a compound known as the Polygon, and William was supportive of Mary's career. Unfortunately, Mary died in September of 1797 after giving birth to her second child, daughter Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, who was better known as Mary Shelley the author of Frankenstein. Now, as the Enlightenment was ongoing, it was inevitable that their ideas were beginning to impact the political sphere. As some monarchs of the 18th century seemed willing to adopt these Enlightenment ideas in their own governance. A notable example is Russia's great Tsarina, Catherine the Great. Catherine was not born into Russian nobility. She married into it. She was actually German. She regarded the Russian language and some Russian culture as very barbaric, and so she looked to the West for inspiration. Well, she found it in her homeland in Germany, but also in France. Now, Catherine began insisting that French become the official language of the Russian court, finally pushing out Russian for good. Now, Catherine's great enlightenment push focused on education. She required the daughters of the nobility be educated. She argued that that way, those daughters, soon to be mothers, would provide a good foundation for the children of Russian nobility. But Catherine also found the ideas of various French philosophers, especially those of Denis Diderot, intriguing, and she wanted to follow up on them. She invited Diderot to Russia to outline reforms for her country, but they ultimately had a falling out. Well, in the end, she decided that she didn't like Diderot's suggested reforms because they were all theoretical. Nothing had ever been proven to work. While she was open to Enlightenment ideals, Catherine had been raised in an absolutist system, and she ruled that way. Well, she favored the aristocracy and so alienated the peasants. Well, these peasants tended to rebel, and each rebellion underscored her belief that reform wouldn't work because peasants couldn't be educated. Well, eventually, Catherine grew fearful of losing political power, so she ordered a censorship of the press. That action led to the end of the friendship between Catherine and Diderot. 
In the end, with Catherine as with many enlightened absolutists, her attempts to meld the enlightenment with absolute power were not terribly successful, as she retained absolute power only by turning her back on the major tenets of the enlightenment. While the biggest concern of the absolutists, enlightened or not, was that allowing criticism of the government would lead to rebellious or treasonous activity. In fact, at the end of the 18th century, there were two major revolutions. But the first to break out was not against an officially absolutist government, but actually a constitutional monarchy. By the middle of the 18th century, England, which had become Great Britain in 1707 after the official union of the Scottish and English parliaments, had become the world's largest colonial power, with an empire that stretched not just across the Atlantic, but also throughout parts of Africa and Asia. A problems with their empire emerged in the American colonies, where the colonists considered themselves British subjects and expected the same rights and protections granted to people living in Great Britain itself. The British, however, including the king, George III, and the parliament, considered most of their subjects in the colonies backward and provincial, and they preferred to keep more direct control over economic policies in the Americas. Now, this didn't sit well with the colonists who wanted a greater autonomy both politically and economically. Tensions broke out in 1770, this was the Boston Massacre, and rebellious activity continued through the early 1770s, such as the Boston Tea Party. Twelve of the 13 colonies Georgia was absent, aware of the dangers of escalating tensions with Britain, sent representatives to a meeting of the Continental Congress in Philadelphia during September and October of 1774. The purpose of this Congress was to discuss what the colonies should do against the British. Now, generally, after much discussion, it was agreed that the colonies would attempt to communicate to Parliament and the King just how oppressive British policies were, and to agree to an effective embargo on some British goods. At the same time, they made initial plans for what to do should Parliament and the King not listen, and they promised to try to regulate a resistance to the British should that occur. Well, representatives made it all the way to Britain and met with Parliament, and as you can imagine, Parliament and King George were not amused. In the spring of 1775, the British Parliament sent a fleet of soldiers to Boston, hoping that extensive military presence there would be enough to stop any hint of rebellion, especially once the suspected rebel leaders were arrested. However, on the night of April 18, 1775, riders went out from various parts of Boston and Cambridge to warn of the British military landing. In the early morning hours of April 19, a Patriot militia met British troops at a field between Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. Shots were exchanged. A revolution had begun. Accordingly, the Second Continental Congress met in May 1775. This Congress, still without Georgia, Georgia wouldn't send delegates until June, assumed powers of government for the United Colonies, created a currency, and organized an army, naming George Washington as that army's commander. By the time the Congress met for the second time, the war had well and truly begun, but the colonists hadn't yet declared independence from Britain. Now, some representatives were still hopeful that Parliament and the King might agree to compromise, but it soon became clear that this wasn't going to happen. Now, some Enlightenment philosophers, such as Thomas Paine, published essays in support of the revolution, and this support, along with the general belief that independence was now a necessity, led the Congress to begin drafting a Declaration of Independence in June of 1776. On July 4th, 1776, Congress formally approved the Declaration of Independence, having voted on it two days before. There was one abstention during the vote. New York abstained. But political commentators made much of this declaration. By 1777, countries would begin to recognize the brand new state. The Netherlands and Morocco would be the first to recognize the new United States. At the end of the 1780s, another revolution would begin, this time back in Europe. 
In many ways, it's that second revolution, the French Revolution, which was seen as the culmination of the Enlightenment. We'll explore precisely why that might be in class.